Good morning, everyone. I'm here to do a, a wee little temple talk. <laughs> not much, not really a temple talk, but I'm, I'm here to advertise about the community kitchen. I don't know if you've seen it. It's been kind of buried in the interfaith part of the e-news, but on May 3rd, they're going to have a hunger walk. Now, we happen to have another thing happening at that exact same time, and that is called our pastor's farewell. So I don't expect that you have to go do the walk, but you can still donate. But I just want you guys to know that Gloria Day has been making meals for the community kitchen has moved different places, but for the community kitchen for 35 years, every Friday. So, yay! A lot of people way before me. If you have ever made work down there, had made cookies for it, or whatever, I want you to stand up. Everybody who's been a part of the cookie brigade or you've worked down there, one way or another, look at, yay, thank you guys! I appreciate that so much. It, you don't realize just a little bit of help, it goes so much along the way. So you can always get in the cookie brigade. You can get in the, the church website and sign up for it real easy if you wanna just bring some cookies, it gives you directions. But the other way you can help is to just go on here and donate. Now there's a, there's a site for Gloria Day. We're trying to get $2,000. So we'll see if we can make it to that. And that money is this year being split between the food bank and the community kitchen. And believe me, we get a lot of our food from the food bank. So it really is a symbiotic um, relationship. So we really um, do make out for that. And if you want to know more about the, co the community kitchen, Make sure you grab one of our annual reports that's out there and you can read my, my, my little saga in there about what all we do and how we do it. So anyway, that is the main thing I wanted to say and I really wanted to just thank everybody who has been down there and supported us in so many ways. Lastly, on the Sunday, uh, pardon me, the um, Saturday after Easter, that'd be the 23rd of April, there is a new member orientation from nine till noon here at the church, uh, complimentary uh, continental breakfast. But if, if you're interested in finding out about the ministries of, uh, of uh, this congregation, or if you know somebody that might be interested in Gloria Day, direct them to that Saturday morning, the 23rd. I'm going to see if I have any juice in the testing. One, two. No, not working. We'll go from here. Yeah. 
We don't have kneelers here, but we're going to stay seated for the confession and absolution. Kind of mentally kneel as we go through this. We'll continue on page one in the order of worship. We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit so that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. Upon this, your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I announce to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we will ask those who are able to stand for our opening hymn, 624. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. O oh God, Father in heaven, have mercy upon us. Oh. 
O Son of God, Redeemer of the world, have mercy upon us. O God, Holy Spirit, have mercy upon us. Let us pray. O oh God, with all your faithful followers of every day, we praise you, the rock of our life. Continue to form us into the likeness of Jesus, that we may be his body in the world and gladly minister to all. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading today is from Isaiah 43, chapters, or chapter 43, verses 16 to 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness, the rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they may declare my praise. Here ends the reading. This, please read with me Psalm 126 responsively. When the Lord restored the for fortunes of Zion, there were, then we were like those who dream, then our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. The second reading today is Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b to 14. Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, whenever, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, 
the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Jesus Christ. Here ends the reading. We're live. Children, I need the children, kids to come up here and help me for a few moments. Come on up and give me some help. One is fine, two is better. Come on up. Oh, good, we got a bunch coming. Just come have a seat here. Okay, you can sit down. How about sitting on the soft pads? That would be good. What? Can you come over on this side so we're all together over here? Thank you. Somebody gave me a gift a while back, and I, I'm having trouble with this. I thought maybe you could help me. They gave me this really neat thermos. I love the color. It's a beautiful turquoise color, and uh, I really like it, but here's my problem. I can't get anything out of it. I try and drink out of it, and nothing happens. I mean, I try to unscrew this, and I mean, it's just, I, I, something's wrong with this thermos. Do you know what's the problem? What? It's upside down. Ups- what do you mean upside down? They told me this was right side up. I mean, if I go this way, it works. Well, what do I have to do now? Well, unscrew that? Well, let me try. Let me see. Whoa! There's a hole there. It looks like there's water in there. Let me try it. By golly, that works. That was about my whole problem. I had it upside down. In fact, I could have tried for 10 years to try and get water out of here that way. It wouldn't have worked, would it? You know, got to have it right side up and then screw it. Let's talk about this a minute. A lot of people get life upside down, or parts of life upside down. I'll give you an example. Somebody's mean to you, and you don't like that, so you hit them. Is that right side up or upside down? Yeah, upside down, upside down yeah. Uh, you did something maybe you shouldn't have done. You don't want to get caught, so you lie about it. Is that right side up or upside down? Upside down. Upside down. We can have a lot of examples of how people have life upside down. And life ends up not very happy sometimes when we live it that way. It's better if we turn life right side up so that when somebody hurts us, Instead of maybe wanting to hit them back or do something mean, we forgive them, don't we? Instead of lying, it's always better to tell the truth. Well, you know who helps us get life right side up? What's his name? Jesus. That's almost always the right answer. (laughs) Well, and that's why we come together every week like this, and you do things at home, and, and read the Bible, go to Sunday school, to learn more about Jesus who helps us keep life right side up. Does that make sense? Always. Amen. Thank you, children. You're a good help. You can go back to your parents. You might have noticed we didn't read the gospel today. That's because it's going to be incorporated into the sermon. We'll tell the story. And we're going to start this a little different way as well this morning. You know the system. You know what you're supposed to say. When I say knock, knock, you say? Okay, so let's try this. Knock, knock. 
Well, wait a minute. I, you're awake because you're here. Let's ramp this up a little bit. Knock, knock. Jesus. Can we get just a little more oomph into this? <laughs> knock, knock. Jesus. Jesus. That is the question, isn't it? That's the question. Jesus who? Maybe worded the other way. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus for you? That is precisely what Jesus asked his best friends, his disciples, on that morning in Caesarea Philippi. The gospel is taken from Matthew 16, the 15 chapters before this of what of events in Jesus' life, he did and said all kinds of things that raised eyebrows. I mean really raised eyebrows. People were healed of all kinds of diseases. Demons were cast out. The blind could see he gave hearing to the deaf. The dumb could speak. He forgave sins. He comforted the bereaved. He even raised from the dead. It's no wonder people were asking all over the country, who is this guy? Jesus who? Well, before we start examining that a little bit, we need to recognize there's an auxiliary, a complementary question, kind of the flip side of the coin that goes along with this. Once one determines, when you determine just who Jesus is for you, whatever that might mean, once you've got that at least somewhat figured out, a starting point, what do you do with that? Jesus who? What's that got to do with my life, my, my thoughts, my decisions, my actions? We'll revisit that in a couple minutes. Back to Jesus who. There are lots of possibilities I know you're not going to be able to see all of these, but some of the Jesus who, these are 30 starters. Now, you can't read those all from back there. You can come up and look at them later, but many are, we're quite familiar with. Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Good Shepherd, Son of God, Son of Man, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, Teacher, Rabbi, Redeemer. The list goes on and on, and this is just a start. Well, take your pick. But which one is most meaningful to you? Which one seems to draw your focus more than others? That's a, a very individual preference. And it comes from a lifetime of working at it. So take your pick of the possibilities, but there is an important distinction to be made, a significant one. It's um, this distinction has been tackled from all kinds of different angles over the ages, asking questions like, what's Jesus' essence? What's he made of? Where did he come from? Not just Nazareth or son of Mary, but even beyond that. Ordinary people just don't do and say what Jesus was doing. What is different about Jesus? Different from, well, Anyone else in human history? The Bible says yes. There absolutely is something distinctively different, unique, out of the ordinary about Jesus. A study of that, that area of theology, well, the $25 theological word for it is Christology. Our attempt to understand, as if we could, but we got to make a go at it anyway, attempt to understand something about Jesus and this essence, this difference, this distinction. We try to put it into words, and books on Christology could literally, we could line them up from the floor 
to the ceiling, and this is a pretty high ceiling, but the books would go all that way and beyond. Well, we don't have time, at least in the amount of time you give a guy in the pulpit here, <laughs> to survey the whole Christological landscape. But there's a good starting point. We got a good kickoff point in trying to figure out our Christology, and it has to do with Peter's answer. When Jesus came into Caesarea Philippi with his disciples, and people have been asking all these questions about him, after breakfast, I think they're kind of lounging around the disciples waiting for the marching orders for the day, and all of a sudden Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? What are they talking about? Well, some of the, one of the disciples said, well, some say you're John the Baptist come back to life. Others say, well, you might be Isaiah or even Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. I bet you some had even proposed, this is Moses or Father Abraham resurrected. There are all kinds of possibilities. So Jesus looked at his disciples, ended up looking eyeball to eyeball with Peter and said, who do you say that I am? And Peter replied with the first profession of faith in the Christian church. He said, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The Christ, the son of the living God. Those two phrases, those two titles, would fill, the baggage attached to them would fill a good-sized freight train. But we need to recognize something. It's a Jewish freight train we're talking about. Peter was a Jew, born a Jew by birth, brought up in that tradition, culturally, theologically. His whole mindset, his whole way of thinking was Hebrew. That was his context even when he made that profession of faith, naming who Jesus was for him. And I'll share with you what is the foundation of Hebrew thought about life or about God. The foundation of Hebrew thought are things like this. What's for dinner? Oh, our two twins. What should we name those two new beautiful twin girls of ours? By the way, our neighbor broke his leg. What can we do to help him or his family? Let's see. Would I make a better carpenter or a baker? Questions like that. You see, the primary Jewish concern, some would say the only, when thinking about God is this. How does God want me to lead the life God has given me? How does God want me to lead the life I've been given? You see, in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, there's no developed concept of heaven. There are some hints in Jewish thought about something going on after this one. There's a, a term called olam abba in Hebrew, which simply is translated the world to come. It's a very undefined, unrefined concept. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, and neither did the Jews, and neither would an Orthodox Jew today say there's nothing after this life. But the focus, the primary, absolute, first and foremost focus, which was Peter's focus, is on life lived every day on this rugged old planet we call Earth. Peter and the boys were looking for the Messiah, for the Christ to be sure, but they were looking for the Christ to come and transform and renew the life that they had, that they were living. They were looking for the Christ to come and transform and renew the life you and I live every morning when our feet hit the floor. What are we going to do with this day, with life? A few weeks ago, Transition Sunday, Pastor Phil Rue preached here. And he preached on that, trans, that um, transfiguration text where it starts with Jesus, Peter, James, and John on the mountain, that kind of unique, special spiritual experience, but then transition where they had to run back down into the valley to live life. And in that sermon, Pastor Phil said this, mountaintop experiences are meant to make a difference in our lives lived in the valley. Mountaintop experiences 
are only good for life lived back down in the valley. And I believe it's worth noting that in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, three whole chapters, the longest by far continuous oration in the Scriptures, in that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus does not say one word about what to believe, only words about what to do, how to live life down in the valley. Jesus obviously affirmed that there's something that goes on after this life, but the feeling I get from reading those Gospels over and over, Jesus says, eternal life, heaven, wherever you want to conceptualize it or, or what words you want to use, that's a promise. That's a guarantee. Now fold that up and put that in your back pocket because you have a much more pressing concern. It's called the next 24 hours. What we're going to do with this day and the next. When pastors retire, which I did in 2013, you got to figure out what to do with your library. And I had acquired quite an extensive theological library over the years, but I didn't have room for them in my house. Plus, I figured other younger pastors or you know, somebody else might be able to use them, so I gave away most of those, my books. Of the few that I kept, one was by the esteemed German theologian Ernst Kaysmann in a book with a beautiful title, Jesus Means Freedom. In that book, you'll find this quote. There is no sense talking about Christ's lordship if Christians are not willing to recognize his lordship over their conduct. That brings us back to that earlier question I said we'd revisit. What does standing alongside Peter, if we do, looking at Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, what does that have to do with my life, my thinking, my decisions, my actions? Which, of course, leads to the question, how did Jesus live life in the valley? What guidelines are we given by looking at Jesus' life in the valley? And before we give a couple examples, I want to note something important. We're talking about Jesus here, rightly understood. All manners of horrors have been accomplished with a Jesus wrongly understood. Just one example. On Thanksgiving evening of 1915, the people of Atlanta, Georgia, looked north to Stone Mountain, 15 miles north, and saw a bright burning flame on that mountain, rising into the darkness of the night. The city was still reeling from a summer of anti-Semitic angst over the murder and conviction and subsequent lynching of the Jewish industrialist Leo Frank. And the people probably could have been excused to thinking that that burning object on the summit of Mount Stone were Jews reacting in vengeance or some kind of payback. But in fact, that burning cross was put there by the violent, same violently anti-immigrant mob who committed that act of so-called justice when they lynched Leo Frank and they were now instituting a revival, an enthusiastic revival with a burning cross of the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK has always claimed that they're lighting the cross in celebration, not doing something malicious. But guess what they're celebrating? With that burning cross, they're celebrating the blacks and the Hispanics, and the Mexicans, and the Asians hanging from nooses behind that cross. Jesus wrongly understood can result in all kinds of horrors. So we ask, what do the Gospels reveal about Jesus rightly understood, about how he lived life in the valley? How much time you got? I mean, we could talk until the cows come home and the sun goes down and just kind of hit the tip of the iceberg. It could be a long, long study. But a few key examples will give us that starting point again about the way Jesus thought and acted. We could start with his parable of the Good Samaritan. I'd be surprised if you didn't know that one. What was the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan? 
if people need help, you try to help them. Even if, maybe especially if, their folks are not like you. Maybe even supposedly your enemies. He said, go and do likewise. They're your neighbors. Later in this gospel, after today's lesson in chapter 16, in chapter 25, you got the story of Jesus talking about entry into the kingdom of God. And he says, those of you that enter because you fed me when I was hungry, Jesus says, you clothed me when I was naked, you gave me drink when I was thirsty. And they said, when did we do that? He said, when you did it to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it unto me. Pretty strong hint. And then over and over again in the four Gospels, we find Jesus affirming everybody. Not just his Jewish community. Not just people that look like him, talk like him, had the same cultural background. Everybody. One clue of that is at the end of the Gospel of Mark. The person that stands at the foot of the cross when Jesus just died and said, truly this man was the Son of God, that was a Gentile Roman centurion. Part of the emphasis on life lived in the valley, affirming, accepting, loving one another, all of us. Now, all of these things, and again, that's just the very tip of the iceberg. We could do a much longer study, but all these things can be done by anyone. Someone can lead a Jesus kind of life, even if they don't believe in or follow Jesus. He's not part of their context. But if Jesus is, if Jesus is not in the picture, might happen, might not. It's kind of a pig in a poke. We give thanks for those who do live that kind of life. But if Peter's who is Jesus is our who is Jesus, my friends, it's inevitable. We're going to follow in Jesus' steps. We're going to try to live life in the valley as he did, as he showed us the way. Now, nobody does that completely. Nobody does that perfectly, of course. I'm reminded of the little boy who got mad at his sister and he slapped her. Well, his mother, good Christian she was, took him aside and she said, Billy, would Jesus do something like that? And Billy put his hands on his hips and he said, no, he wouldn't, but I'm not Jesus. <laughs> I mean, we've got a ways to go, yes. And some of us, some do better than others, obviously, but we're all supposed to be working at it. We're all supposed to be giving it our all. We're all supposed to be, as Martin Luther wrote in his lectures on the Romans, striving with all our might to follow in Jesus' steps, the steps of the Son of the living God. There's a word in Hebrew, ruah, which can be translated three different ways. Same Hebrew word, depending on the context, can be translated into English as Spirit, wind, or breath. There's a word in Greek, paneoma, which can be translated depending on, just like the Hebrew word, the Greek word paneoma can be translated spirit, or wind, or breath. I sleep every night with my head just inches from an open window. How far the window is open depends on the weather. <laughs> But sometimes it's as a gentle breeze that caresses my face as I'm drifting off to sleep. Sometimes it's a gusty, gutsy wind like it's trying to prove something. But whatever it is, one of those or somewhere in between, just about invariably as I feel that breath, that wind, that spirit coming over my body, I think of the words of the first verse of the hymn we're going to sing in a few minutes. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love just as you love and do what you would do. And the gospel. 
the good news gospel is that the ever more deeply we breathe in the breath of God, the more and more the spirit of the living God infuses our every part of our being, the more and more we'll be filled with life anew. The more and more we'll love as Jesus loves. And the more and more we'll do as he would do. One more time. You ready? Knock, knock. Who's there? Jesus. Jesus the Christ. the Son of the living God, who will fill us with a peace that surpasses all human understanding and will keep our hearts and minds in him. Amen. We're using some contemporary words of affirmation of faith. It says the same thing as, uh, as the Apostles' Creed does, but a little different wording, maybe to just encourage us to think about it in new ways. We confess our faith together. We believe in God, the Creator Spirit, who moved upon the face of the deep at the beginning of creation, who created all that is, and who spoke through the prophets of old. We believe in Jesus Christ, into whom God's Spirit was poured in fullness and in power, in whose crucifixion and resurrection the whole creation is restored and unified, and who promised that the Spirit would come and fill the faithful with power to witness to the mighty love of God. We call on that Spirit with longing hearts, seeking to be empowered to witness to God's love in Christ with bold words and courageous actions of love and hope. We proclaim the good news of all that God has done for us. Glory be to God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, now and always. Pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord Jesus, along with Peter and all the saints through the ages, we confess you as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Prepare us, your church, for our mission in bearing witness to Christ, both here at home and throughout the world. Merciful God, 
receive our prayer. Trusting in the promise of never-ending life, never-ending life in you, O God, we pray for a bold commitment to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Help us to rightly understand his message and example, and then strive in the strength of your spirit to shine the light of the gospel in all our thoughts, words, and deeds. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of strength and comfort, though we often walk in the midst of trouble, we acknowledge your indwelling spirit to help us through. For the people suffering trials and tribulations, those struggling in body, mind, or spirit, those overwhelmed with anxiety or depression, and especially the beleaguered people of Ukraine and Russia, we pray that an awareness of your suffering with them will provide solace and, and perseverance. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Creator God, praise of you arises from the far reaches of the universe to the smallest of creatures. Join our songs to theirs so that a spirit of celebration and thanksgiving arouses us to cherish and care for this, this wonderful home in which, with which we are blessed. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of creation, you call us together at Gloria Day, in which we, though many, are one in Christ. May we recognize in ourselves and in one another the unique gifts that you have given us for this building up, for this building up of the church for the sake of the world. Merciful God, receive our prayer. In the sure and certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I, I share that peace with one another. Peace of the Lord be with you.
God of the universe, thank you that your promises are true. Your word says that we will find joy in offering our time, talents, and money to meet the needs of others. Help us to freely give sacrificially and cheerfully toward the work of your kingdom. May you cause the seeds that we sow to grow into the well-watered fruits of life. Now we gather at your feast where you offer us that which truly satisfies. Come among us and feed us with the body and blood of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We continue with the great thanksgiving on page 10 in your worship folder. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, so that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we stand and praise your name and join their unending hymn. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. We had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, after they had eaten, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink, drink of it, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this often to remember me. We sing the prayer our Lord taught us. gifts of God for the people of God. Be seated and the ushers will wait upon you.
Now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. And the people said, Faithful God, as we take this bread and this cup, remind us of your heart for the nations. You made this sacrifice so that all could be blessed and brought into your spiritual family. Show us how to share this good news, both in our community and around the world. Give us the wisdom and discernment to do that. May the earth be filled with the knowledge of your glory, just as the waters cover the sea. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is printed in the back of your bulletin. <laughs> Go in peace as God's growing family to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>